We've been looking at Jesus' uh, exposure, if you please, exposing the Pharisees. And in his doing that, warning ourselves, warning one let's not be Pharisees, because there is a Pharisee living in every heart, dying to get out, dying to judge, dying to set up external religion and make it count for internal spirituality. Jesus moves from that today, though, and performs a miracle, and it's, it is different from any other miracle he performs in all the Gospels. We'll see why in a moment. In Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26, as we think about these lessons from a miracle today, I want to ask you if you would to stand with me out of honor of God's Word. And you just follow along as I read, and if you hope you have your Bible, and if you don't have a Bible, we'll get you one, but the text is on the screens for you right now. <clears throat> and they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village, and when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again. And he opened his eyes and his sight was restored. And he saw everything clearly. And he sent him to his home saying, do not even enter the village. We're going to learn about the ways of our Savior today, some lessons we need to know and be reminded of. But we've read from, what have we read from? The, the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. As we embrace its truth today, may we be embraced by it and changed. Thank you. Please be seated. This is another one of the episodes in the Gospel of Mark that, that is not told us by Matthew, Luke, or John. So we are richer for having this, this gospel account. He tells us about this healing of this blind man at Beth Bethsaida. Now we know when we read the miracles, we told you in fact in the beginning of Mark that Jesus, Jesus really lets us in on why he performs miracles. When, when they take the, the man the paralytic and put him in front of Jesus in, the, in that courtyard where he was teaching. Jesus says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, speaking to the man on the mat, rise, take up your bed and walk. Now his argument was, I'm going to show you something tangible to help you understand the intangible, the spiritual, my authority to forgive sins. Because he asks in that episode, remember, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or to say rise, take up your bed and walk? Easier in terms of more easily verified. So this miracle today that we're studying is done for a reason. And I really believe it's, it's preparatory to what we're going to be studying in the next section, Mark's account of the confession of faith in Christ at Caesarea Philippi. We'll be looking at that later. Because what you're going to see is that the disciples have been with him, and they haven't really seen things clearly. So let's learn from this, this miracle. Let's learn the gospel truths. And what makes this miracle unique is that this man is healed gradually by degrees. In no other miracle will you find that in the New Testament, in, in, in the ministry of Jesus. And I believe it's a picture of the way that God saves sinners by the almighty power and grace of His Holy Spirit. So let's look at what this, I want you to unpack it with me today under these five headings. First of all, friends bring a blind man to Jesus, and we, we're going to learn in that a lesson in evangelism. Secondly, that Jesus removes the man from his familiar surroundings, a lesson in separation. 
Third, the man receives sight but not full sight, a lesson in God's sovereignty in dealing with sinners. Fourth, a man receives full sight. That's a lesson in Jesus' mercy. And then fifth, Jesus makes this strange request. It's a lesson in judgment. Look at the first one with me, if you will. These friends bring a blind man to Jesus. Teaches us about evangelism. Look, it says, and they came to Bethsaida. I was talking about Jesus and the apostles now arriving there. They've been traveling back and forth across the lake, remember? And some people brought to him a blind man and begged him to touch him. That is so powerful. They were genuinely concerned about their friend. They wanted their friend to see. They believed that Jesus could make him see. It's interesting, we have nothing here to lead us to believe that this man instigated this at all. He's blind, I mean, it'd be difficult to resist. He goes along with them. Maybe, I'm sure deep down in his heart he wanted to see. But here we want to see the focus is on the friends. They brought him to Jesus. And they begged Jesus to touch him. You know, we, we ebb and flow, don't we, in our, what we might call evangelistic zeal, evangelistic passion. There are times when we have an, we're in earnest. We can hardly talk about someone we want to see come to Christ without, without tearing up, without choking up. But it's interesting when that doesn't happen immediately or it doesn't ha happen in the, in the short term, we can sometimes lose our zeal, lose our fervor, lose our passion, almost as if we have resigned to what, what some would call a hyper-Calvinistic position. Well, God's going to save him. He's going to be saved. If he's not, there's nothing I can do. That's, you don't see that at all in the Scripture. In fact, you read this account, and as I cited earlier, my mind goes back to the courtyard. When we looked at that in, earlier in Mark, where the men came with a the, with the mat, and they said, we've got to get our friend before Jesus. He's, he's paralyzed, but if Jesus will touch him, he'll be made whole. And they get there, and the crowd is so great, they can't even get close. They can't get in the courtyard. And some would have turned and gone away at that point, but, but they hatched this idea. It's a, it's a destructive idea to the homeowner. They go up and tear back shingles off the roof. They pull back the matting. So they finally have a, a way that they can drop this man in front of Jesus. It was very distracting to the Bible study he was doing. They desperately wanted their friend to be made whole. Here we have a similar situation. They begged Jesus to touch him. You can almost hear their cries of compassion. Master, we, we've heard great things about you. We've, your, your miracle ministry precedes you. Please, please, please give our friend sight. Brothers and sisters, never be ashamed to weep over those you want to see saved. And never forget that you and I know people who are not converted. We must not be content to let them live their lives and just go on to hell. We must not. There's a promise in the Word that if we go forth weeping, bearing precious seed, that the gospel seed picture there, we will come again rejoicing, bringing our sheaves, bringing the fruit of our labor with us, bringing the fruit of our tears, they begged him. They begged Jesus to touch him. So I want to ask you, when's the last time you brought somebody to Jesus that way? I don't mean physically that you, I mean, you could bring somebody into the church setting. You could bring somebody into a Bible study where, where the truth is being taught and, and where the wind blows. We believe that the, that the wind of the Spirit blows in these kinds of gatherings. It could be that, but I'm talking about in your heart. When's the last time in your heart that you, you begged Jesus, to save somebody, 
that you know is perishing. There's a lesson here for us in evangelism. You shouldn't, we shouldn't have to have a Monday night evangelism time scheduled for us to do evangelism. It ought to be the outflow of our lives. So the first thing we learn is compassionate evangelism. Share the gospel with them. Pray. Pray, oh God, I've put, I've set gospel seed. I've put the story of Jesus before them. I've told them how Jesus showed his love for sinners by coming and living and dying and rising from the grave. I've told them that, Lord. I've told them and of their need to trust him and of the promise he gives that, that whoever comes to him, he will turn away none who come to him. And then you, you water that with your prayerful tears. Lord, save this person. Take what they know. Take what they've heard growing what they hear from family and friends around them and make the gospel effectual in their lives so that they cry out for sin and faith in you and trust Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior. That's, that's what we see here. And it's an admonition to us to be the same way. The second thing we see is that Jesus removes the man from his familiar surroundings. You see, the touch that Jesus is going to give this man is not just a touch along the way. You're going to see in a little while why he draws him aside in a few minutes here. The verse says in verse 1, he took the blind man by the hand. that, That had to thrill this man. This man cannot see. His friends are telling him what they're going to do. We're going to take you to Jesus, the rabbi. He heals people. And the man's, you've got to get yourself, he, he's wondering, can it be true? Will I, really, will I even get to meet him? I've, I've, I've heard that the crowds that press around him make it almost impossible to get close. What do you think when Jesus took this man by the hand? He makes it personal. Just like he made it personal when he saved you and me. He doesn't save in mass. I promise you, every one of the people saved on the day of Pentecost sensed it personally. They weren't part of of a movement. They were part of a saving encounter with the risen Jesus Christ. And so he takes him by the hand, and he leads him out of the village. He separates the man. Now... I don't know when you were saved, how old you were when you were saved, but I, but I promise you when the Lord saved you, there was some separation that took place. For some, it may have been separation in your, in your home, your family. You may have been saved in a situation where there was no religious climate and, and there, was, there was sort of a puzzlement that what's going on with you. Maybe the attitude was, oh, I don't know, he's, he got religion, but he'll get over it, don't worry. Maybe you were in a, in a religious climate where, where they assumed and believed that everything had been taken care of. You've got this, this evangelistic fervor, this, this zeal for Christ that really is kind of intimidating. I've told you before about our friends Doug and, and Meseret. They're back in the States, coming back to the States. And when Meseret was a young a teenage girl in... Uh, to gray Ethiopia there. Uh, her family was part of the, that African Orthodox or Ethiopian Orthodox church where you, just, you grow up in it, you're, you're born into it, you're a member of that church. And she got a good dose of grace, a good dose of salvation and went home to tell her father who was a leading figure in the community and a, and a leading figure in the church. And she told him, she said, I've, I've been saved. Jesus Christ has saved me. I've given my life to Jesus. He, he beat her. This isn't in 96 A.D. He beat her in the 21st century. 
Because what she was saying was an insult to to the religion of their home. Separation occurs. Perhaps you separated yourself or were separated from some bad company, from bad conduct. In other words, there's a break that comes, and so you, you have this lesson in separation. When a person is saved, he's not the same. There's, we use words. The word conversion. When a person is converted, the very word conversion means to change. It means, it means I was going this direction, and I turned. Conversion is a turning, and now I'm going this direction. I was talking with a man years and years ago now, just in, in many ways a really great guy, who believed that he, was, that he had always been a Christian. I've always been a Christian. I was born a Christian. I was baptized as an infant as a Christian. And so I kept pressing him. But when, when did the change come? When did your life change directions? And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, well, the Scripture teaches that there's a change that comes. No. No change, but I'm sure I'm a Christian. And it was, it, it was so challenging talking to him. His life went on as it had before. No. Jesus demonstrates here in the, in the healing of this man that there's a break that is made. You've been studying 1 John in the Bible study time. 1 John 2 12 to 15 says, Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, that's not from the Father but from the world. And the world is passing away. And those kind of lusts are passing away with it. But he who is doing the will of God, practicing the will of God, making that break and living differently is abiding forever. That's John teaches that about the break that comes. There's a lesson in separation. Look at the third thing here. This man received sight but not full sight. This is a lesson in God's sovereign prerogative. A good friend of mine years ago was telling me about the way he had been converted. And it was pretty it was a pretty drastic, pretty dramatic occurrence. He worked for one of the plants in Baton Rouge. His life, he, he, had a, he had a father-in-law that was praying for him, and he was not being a good husband to his wife. His wife loved the Lord, and he didn't really care much for that. But it began to eat on him. And he was telling me his story. He said at a certain night, he was in the, in the shack, the part of the, plant where he worked. He was part of the security there. He said he walked out. He said it just got so miserable. Walked outside the shack, dropped on his knees during that midnight shift and just cried out, I I give up. I give up. I'm yours, Jesus. You you can have me. I'm, I'm sorry. It was a powerful conversion and radical change. I mean radical change. And he was telling me this. He was the, actually the chairman of deacons at, at the church there in Clinton where I was serving. And then he, then, then he did this. He superimposed his experience on everyone else. And if somebody had not had that kind of a dramatic uh, Damascus Road experience, then he didn't believe they were converted. <laughs> I told him, I said, you cannot make your conversion experience everybody else's because God is sovereign. He saves some at a young age, tender little children. Some he saves at an older age. But he is sovereign in this subject of salvation. And Jesus shows this in this miracle if we'll look at it right. Because he doesn't do this any other time in any one of the four Gospels. Everywhere else, Lazarus come forth, a dead man comes out of the tomb. Little girl arise, a dead girl rises up on her on her deathbed. Stand up and walk. The man gets up and leaps and runs away. Stretch out your hand, healed. Open your eyes. We in blind Bartimaeus, we read that passage. Opens his eyes. But here it's different. Jesus had asked him, Do you see anything? 
after he, after he takes the, the, the spit and, 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 and mud and forms it and rubs it over his eyes. He doesn't always do that. But he does so here. He applies means to emphasize something, to teach his disciples something. Remember, he's doing this in their presence before we have that next story, the next part of the narrative, where he asked them, who do you say that I am? The man answers the question, do you see anything? He said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. They look like trees walking. It's a gradual work that takes place here. And he shows us in this that sometimes his works in our lives are gradual. Now theologians like to debate and fuss and fight and frustrate one another saying, well now is, is the new birth instantaneous or is it not? It can't be. Don't let the theologians debate that. All we're going to do is just gaze at the text and wonder. We're not going to try to make the Word of God fit somebody's theological presuppositions. We're going to let the Word of God shape our theological thoughts. The Lord shows that sometimes He saves sinners gradually. This ought to be an encouragement to us, by the way, because see, it will, it will deliver us from the notion that when we share the gospel, they don't immediately respond positively. We walk away saying, well, they rejected the gospel. Maybe, maybe there's a work going on there that we can't see yet. Maybe first in the, in the corn, in the grain of corn, and then in the ear, and then in, in, in the full blade. Gradually. J.C. Ryle and his expository thoughts on this passage says this, we are all naturally blind and ignorant in the matters which concern our souls. We all start out that way. Nobody has an inside track. I was sharing with a man one time, he was a pastor, and he had come out of a background of, I mean, nothing, zero, no influence at all. First time he heard the gospel, he was converted. And I told You've, you've heard my story a hundred times by now that, that from the earliest days of my life, the earliest when I pressed my mind to go back and, and be aware of something as early as I can be aware of it, I, am, I can't tell you how old I am, but I'm sitting on my mother's lap and she's singing to me about Jesus. So we were talking about this and he said to me, he said, it took more grace for me to be saved than it did you. <laughs> I said, oh, no, it didn't. No, it didn't. I had, a, I had a blessed privilege. I, what I did was I had a lot more light I sinned against than him. But it took the same grace to bring me out of the tomb of my sin that it took to bring him out of the tomb of his sin. So Raul points that out, that we're all naturally that way. Second, he said conversion is an illumination, a change from darkness to light, from blindness to seeing the kingdom of God. And then Raul makes this observation, which I thought was helpful. Few converted people see things distinctly at first. My friend R.F. Gates, whom you've heard me reference, my, one of my mentor, was telling about his conversion one time. He was saved in a Billy Graham crusade in the stadium, the big stadium in Shreveport, Louisiana. He went there. He, he was raised in a, in a denomination where they had had applied water to him when he was young and was a member as far as they were concerned. But he went and he said, Bill, I was sitting there in the stands and something came over me. He said, I couldn't have told you. If you'd been sitting next to me, I couldn't have told you what it was. He said, I didn't even have enough sense to walk down and, and gather with everybody else down at the front. I just sat there thinking, I don't know what's happened to me, but I like it. I hope it doesn't go away. And over the next days and weeks, 
it became clearer to him that what he had experienced in that stadium under the preaching of the gospel was the new birth. He'd been born again. He was changed, never to be the same, but if you had asked him coming out of the stadium, well, did you get saved today? He'd have gone, oh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not even really sure what that means. Because that wasn't the language used in the setting he grew up in. Few people, few converted people see things distinctly at first. That's what's happening here. We see spiritual things gradually. Think about this with me. This is another writer which I thought was very helpful, Don Fortner. First, we see the sinfulness of our deeds. First, we see that. When, when you're first saved, you see the sinfulness of your deeds. I remember, I remember how the Lord just convicted me about my mouth. I had a pretty vile tongue at the age of 20, 18, 19, 20. Now, I wasn't that way around my mama. I would do better than to be that, like that around my mama. But I had it, and when the Lord came to me to convict me and convince me of sin, one of the things I realized was how, how shameful my speech could be. First, we see the sinfulness of our deeds, and then the sinfulness of our hearts. He said, first we see the suitableness and ability of Christ to redeem and save, and then we see his willingness to save. You see, I, there, I'm talking to some people today who are not converted. I know I am. There are people who have not yet trusted in Jesus Christ, and you may be convinced from the Word, convinced from what others have told you, that Jesus is a Savior and is able to save and redeem sinners, but you may not have come to face and see his willingness to save you. Then we see the fact of forgiveness. We see that first. The fact of forgiveness. He's, and then we experience the forgiveness. You know, it's one thing for us to sin against somebody and they say to us, I forgive you. But it's when they show us when they take us and hug us and say, I really do forgive you. And when we're around them later on and they, they don't bring it up, they truly forgive us. You, you experience the fact of forgiveness first and then the experience of forgiveness. First, we see the good news of the gospel. First, we see the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ would come and live and die and rise again for me. And then we begin to see the great truths of the gospel. When you're first saved, you don't become a first-ranked theologian. This, this writer said this, When God first saved me, I knew whom I had believed, but I didn't know much about him. It's the man born blind. Tell us what this man did. You mean you're the teachers we have around here, and you, don't, you can't explain to me what happened to me? All I know is this, I couldn't see, and now I can see. Jesus comes to him and says, do you believe in the Messiah? And the man says, he says, if, if you, if you show, show him to me, I will. You're the one that opened my eyes. It's gradual. He says, I knew that the Lord Jesus Christ is my God and Savior, but I did not know much about eternal sonship, the distinctions of the three persons in the Trinity. I was convinced of my sin, but I did not know the difference between iniquity, transgression, and sin. I was convinced that Christ had brought in everlasting righteousness for me but that I, and that I had no righteousness but him, but I knew nothing about the imputation of righteousness. He goes on and on about this great description, the difference. Well, but the good news is that God's sovereignty in saving a person, even though there, there may be that experience where you, where you can you see now? I, I see something, but I'm not sure. It's, 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 the, it's what John Bunyan tries to paint in Pilgrim's Progress when, when, when Christian, with that burden on his back, desperate to get it off, encounters evangelists. What must I do? He says, evangelist says, you need to go to the small gate, the wicked gate, and you get help there. Do you see the wicked gate? He said, 
I don't think, I don't see the, he said, do you see the light? He said, I think I see the light. Then walk to the light until you see the gate. It's a powerful picture for us. Pointing sinners, never discouraging them. You see, in addition to God's sovereignty, we see Jesus' mercy. Look at number four, the man receives full sight. Here's the lesson in Jesus' mercy. He doesn't leave him there and he doesn't leave us there. When he first does his saving work in us and we may still be fuzzy about it, he doesn't leave us there. Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again and he opened his eyes and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. You know that. When you go from from fuzziness about what's happened to you in salvation to increasing clarity. Let me tell you something. 40, 43 years hence from the beauty of Christ is so much richer than it was the day that I realized He was saving me from my dead religion. That was an awesome day, but, but today, the beauty of Christ, the preciousness of the doctrines of Christ. You see, it, it is true that the longer you serve Him, the sweeter He grows. You show me a Christian who's getting dull and finds the Christian life dull after years and decades, and I'll show you a person who is either neglecting the means of grace and is in a backward state or has never been converted at all. Because you see, as, as we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds on our way. Jesus sees Him again, and He saw everything clearly. We begin to have discernment. Discerning what is right and wrong. Discerning what is true and not true. One writer says, when you begin to see everything dearly, clearly, here's what you're seeing. He sees the first man, Adam, clearly, as both a representative man representing all the human race and a typical man typifying Jesus Christ. He sees the second man, Christ our Lord, clearly. Then he begins to see the natural man, the lost man. He sees that's what he was. It shocked me. If you'd have talked to me the day or two or three or four before the Lord really saved me at the age of 20. And you said, how is it? Are you a Christian? I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, I was baptized when I was 10. And I, but when the Lord saved me, it shocked me because I realized had I perished at 19, I'd have gone to hell with a church membership card in my pocket. The natural man, the ruined condition of what I was without Christ, the ruined condition of what all are without Christ. We want to get angry with all that's going on in our culture because of the way that they're just desecrating everything, desecrating the Bible, desecrating the name of God, desecrating the the flag. But oh, look at their condition. They're perishing. They will die and go to hell, not because they disagree with me, but because they do not see the beauty of Jesus Christ as their only hope in this world and the world to come. You see the new man, the new man, different from the old man, different from the natural man, the new man, that if anyone's in Christ, he has, he has been made a new creation. Old has passed away. All things are becoming new. 
and you see who you are, you see who the Lord would have you to be. You see the glory of God in the face of Christ and you see the inevitable conformity of your life to Jesus Christ. You see that Christ in you is the hope of glory. That you've been made a partaker of the divine nature. All these biblical promises we have. That the new man is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see more clearly. I've got to wrap this up now. The fifth thing is that Jesus makes a strange request of him. He sent him to his home and said, do not even enter the village I just took you out of. Bethsaida had rejected Jesus earlier. And Jesus saves a man out of it, but judgment is coming upon it. Matthew Henry said this, Bethsaida in the day of her visitation would not know the things that belonged to her peace. In other words, he had, he had come to them and they didn't want to know, wouldn't believe. And now they are hid from her eyes. They will not see, therefore they shall not see. He takes a blind man out of the Bethsaida out into the wilderness, opens his eyes, tells him, don't go back in there. I've opened your eyes to see. I'm not going to open theirs. You see, every, every act of salvation, every act of redemption also has a flip side of judgment upon it. Now, if I speak to anyone today who has, whose eyes are still darkened to Jesus, I say, oh, please, Plead with him to save you. Don't be content in your blindness. Because if you, if you refuse to see him for who he is, then it may well be that in judgment you will not ever see him. Open your eyes. Say, I don't see anything, Lord. Give me light. Now, Lord, I, I see something, but I'm not sure what it is. I'll tell you what, if you, if you experience that, you're on your way to be, being saved. Because he will bring you to full sight. This miracle is different from any other. And it teaches us some things. That we need to learn about ourselves and about salvation and about judgment. So that when he asks his disciples, who do, who do men say that I am? And who do you say that I am? And he asks us, who do you say that I am? We can answer honestly from the heart and the mind. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Savior who saves me and who will save others. Let's pray.